Hi, this is Robert Sanjenis coming to you again this evening on October the 2nd, 2019. This is the open question program set aside for you to ask your questions, make comments about religion, Catholicism, the Bible, anything of a religious nature that is of concern to you. And I, as your host, will try to answer your question with the best of my ability, hopefully making you more comfortable, knowledgeable, and more secure in your own faith. That's my goal. So um, <clears throat> we did have some questions last night, October the 1st, in our program that I didn't get to, and um, I'm going to have those here. Well, actually, you know what? I never did make a copy of them. But, <clears throat> uh, we do have some questions left over from previous sessions that I never got to, so uh, we, can, we can get to those. And, uh, but for those of you who have written in, let me uh, answer your questions first. And uh, looks like we got a few folks early in the program. Ben, Suzanne, how you doing, Suzanne? Uh, Victor, Hiroshi, Ben. So Ben has a question. Uh, hello, Robert. The New Testament talks of new heavens and new earth. What is the purpose of that? since after the final judgment, everyone will be sent to heaven or hell. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure if I understand your question, Ben, because I was assuming that the passage in 2 Peter 3.10 about new heavens and new earth is self-explanatory, Uh, because there, uh, verses 10 to 13, uh, it says that the present universe will be destroyed. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> and that means the heavens as well. Now, there's three heavens, three different kinds of heavens. Okay, there's the first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven. Okay, so the first heaven is like our immediate atmosphere. Okay. And then the second heaven is where the stars are, and the third heaven is where God is, and the angels, and all the saints that are there, okay? So it is the first two heavens that are going to be destroyed with the earth, and thus we need to create new heavens and a new earth, okay? How, uh, how similar they will be, uh, you know, that's anybody's guess. The, the New Testament doesn't give us a lot of information on that aspect of it, but we do know there will be a new earth, okay? And we will have physical bodies, uh, probably much different than we have now. They will be glorious bodies, so magnificent that Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is at a loss for words to tell us uh, what they're going to be like, and he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, and it's not that he's at a loss for words because he doesn't have an inkling as to what they're going to be like. He's at a loss because of the glory that these bodies are going to have. And I think we get a glimpse of that uh, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration and his body was transfigured. And we assume, and I think rightly, that that transfiguration is a forecast, a forecast. Uh, taste of what his glorious body in heaven uh, that he now sits at the right hand of God. Remember that Jesus is in heaven in a physical body, okay, He's sitting at the right hand of God. And uh, so, you know, there's a physical presence there. Uh, and all his physical needs have to be, whatever they are, okay, um, have to be accommodated. All right, so he's not a spirit being up there like the Holy Spirit is and, and God the Father. <clears throat> and um, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, and Philippians chapter 3, 21 say that 
our body will be transformed to be very much like his body. And we will live with him forever and eternity. What a glorious prospect that is, huh? I mean, think about that. Um, <laughs> you know, this, this, this life is, as wisdom and Proverbs say, a vapor that is here one second and gone the next, okay? So whatever your tragedy is, whatever your difficulty, whatever your worry is today, um, you know, think about the fact that, you know, it's going to be here once and then gone and never to occur again. And we will have an eternity of bliss of being with God. Nothing will harm us. Nothing will make us sad. We will have a body that is just, you know, absolutely beautiful and glorious and I mean, it's just unbelievable what's going to happen. And even the scantily descriptive words that the Bible gives us are enough to whet our appetite to make us just yearn for whatever God has in store for us. And we know if it's God's behind it, obviously, it's going to be the best thing that could be created for us especially since we're going to have it for eternity. So, um, and in that, you know, it's going to be a new earth and a new heavens. And, um, man, it's, it's going to be fantastic. So I think I've answered your question. I know I elaborated a little bit because that subject, uh, you know, I think we all need to sit back sometimes and think about the fact that, um, you know, we're here for just a brief time. It seems long compared to earthly life, but compared to eternity, it's just a vapor, all right? And uh, can you imagine how glorious that new heaven and new earth is going to be? Beyond our imagination. And that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8 says. It says um, that uh, it is basically beyond our comprehension right now what it's going to be like. And um, that's God's promise. So you know it's going to be fulfilled. Okay? So hope I answered that sufficiently for you. Uh, Hiroshi says, um, what's your opinion of Bart Ehrman and Richard Carrier? I, Hiroshi, you're going to have to enlighten me on who these people are and tell me what they believe, and then I can give you my opinion. Okay? Uh, there's so many people out there to remember, um, and I'm getting older, and I forget a lot of people's names, and sometimes I know I've studied them in the past, and, and I forget that I've studied them, believe it or not. So, um, you know, you have to help me along here, okay? Uh, Suzanne says, your thoughts on immigrant statue unveiled in the Vatican? Uh, I'm not familiar with that goings on either, Susan, so um, you'll have to enlighten me there. Write back, tell me what went on. I'll give you my opinion on that. Um, I, I can almost guess, you know, what the message is behind that, and that is that, um, you know, all immigrants are to be uh, revered and uh, respected and um, not turned away, I think probably is the big message. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, this is a very complicated subject, and, you know, both sides of this issue, I believe, have things that are true and need to be maintained. Um, but, you know, it gets back to the old um, battle between liberals and conservatives uh, regarding mercy and justice. And I think we might have talked about this a little bit last week. You know, liberals, oh, no, I actually did it in another program I had on Friday. I was interviewed by someone, and uh, we, he was a liberal, believe it or not, that, and, you know, I... 
I tend toward the conservative uh, modes of thinking, if you haven't noticed. And, um, but I try to, you know, have a cordial conversation with this liberal Catholic. And, uh, you know, we got into this thing about mercy and justice. I brought it up. And, and nobody's ever, <clears throat> nobody's ever solved this problem. And I don't think anybody ever will, because in order to solve it, I think you have to be omniscient. You have to know what the motives are um, of each party. You know, each party on earth have laws or principles that they try to abide by, but sometime the, sometimes those principles and laws are infringed upon by the prejudices of the of varying parties, okay? So, um, you know, let's take the conservatives on the one hand. They, they are people, basically, if you want to define a conservative, very simply, it's someone who wants to conserve what we know, what we've practiced, and what we've been taught from the past. We've reached a point and if we're happy with that point, we want to maintain that point, and we want to, in other words, we want to conserve it, okay? A liberal, to, to try to define that as simply as possible, is someone who is looking for change. He is not so much concerned about conserving, unless the conserving is obviously something that no one wants to uh, destroy or dissipate in any way. But he, his mentality is that what was conserved is necessarily suspicious, and he's always looking for the dirt, so to speak, on what happened in the past and believing that as men move on from century to century, they will improve, okay? And if that's the case, then we should be looking for change. And that's basically what a liberal wants to have. He wants to have change because he doesn't trust the past. He doesn't trust what went before, and he believes he has a better idea, so to speak, and therefore does not want to conserve the traditions. Uh, he wants to innovate. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for that uh, because... <clears throat> My gosh, if you go through human history and you look at all the things uh, that were done, people, you know, killing other people and cheating them and lying to them and, you know, who wants that, right? And these are not, these are in the institutions that we have in government, in the church, and in the family, okay? Uh, so not everything that went on in the past was good, okay? You know, some, some of us say, you know, as conservatives, we say, gee, I wish we could, you know, go back to the 1950s, you know, th when things were good, okay? <laughs> There's some truth to that. Yeah, I, I agree. But it's this sort of nostalgia that we're looking for to solve the problem, as if we had no problems in the 1950s. Uh, and, uh, you know, everything just sort of sprung on us in the later 20th century. Uh, some things did, some things didn't, okay? Uh, and this is part of the problem is, you know, the conservative can't say that everything can, has to be conserved. There has to be changes in some things. And the, you know, where, where the difficulty comes into play is what things do you want to change? Okay, now the liberals tend to want to change major things. Okay, like, you know, the institution of marriage, for example. Okay, uh, you know, that's, that's a major change. You can't do that, the conservative says. Okay, and we see where they want to go with this uh, changing of marriage by saying, well, it's okay if... Um, 
on the one hand, uh, two men get married or two women get married, and we have that in the United States today. Uh, or on the other hand, if I don't like my marriage, uh, you know, I, I want a quickie divorce and I want to be able to marry somebody else. And, you know, that's just the way society moves on. And it's good for us because who wants to be in a miserable marriage? That kind of thing. You know, they'll always give the rationale for why they want to change these things. And, you know, you look at it and say, well, yeah, I wouldn't want to be in a bad marriage either. Okay. Uh, but... But you can't change the institution of marriage just because, you know, you have a bad marriage, you know. Go see a counselor. Maybe he can change things for you, okay. So the conservative is trying to basically show the, the liberal that the liberal's means of repairing things is much too drastic. And the conservative wants to give him something that will help the problem but not change the institution, you see. So, no, and then, well, I, I think I've described it enough. And this is the problem with immigration, okay? It, it's caught between the two sides of mercy and justice. On the one hand, there is justice, uh, you know, where the conservatives say, look, we have laws. We have immigration laws. They were set in Congress, and they were made official, and we've abided by these laws for, you know, how many years now, okay? And can't argue with that. Those laws are there, okay? But then, on the other hand, you have the liberals who say that things are not good in other countries, especially, you know, South American or Mexican or Central American countries, and these people barely have enough to eat, they have no good jobs, blah, 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 you know, we know the story, okay, and uh, they're coming up here, and they want to come into the United States, where they think it's going to be, you know, hunky-dory, at least better than what they have now, and uh, I like to sit down and talk to them a little bit about that, because, you know, uh, it's going to be a uh, doggy dog up here. You, you know, yeah, we can get the things that you, that you may want, desire a house, a car, blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> good luck in trying to get them and survive. And it's not going to be real easy. Okay. You, you know, you, just because you come to this country doesn't mean it's just going to be laid in your lap, so to speak. All right. Uh, and you're going to be exploited by the rich people and you're poor and you probably always will be poor even when you come to the United States and there are exceptions to that of course but they're few and far between so the majority of these immigrants are going to be more or less in the same kind of economic status that they are from their original countries all right that's another issue but here the issue here that I'm trying to raise is what do you do with people like this I mean you, you want to be merciful to them on the one hand by allowing them into the United States. On the other hand, you have certain laws that say, you know, um, they have to have certain credentials, they have to have a good reason uh, for, uh, for asylum, for example, uh, all this stuff, okay? And you can't dissolve those laws away just because you want to be merciful, is what the conservative says. On the other hand, the liberal will say, well, look, we have an emergency situation here. We have tens of thousands of people who are homeless, basically, who have no other place to go, and we have the resources to help them. And, you know, this is how a liberal thinks. I'm not saying it's bad. I mean, you know, we need liberals because a lot of them are the ones that have a tendency to show mercy. And that's good, okay? But then what happens is their mercy becomes political. And that's when it gets dangerous, you see. When, now, when, when a liberal who wants to be merciful all of a sudden says that, well, it's okay to break the laws, 
uh, in order to exercise mercy, okay, uh, yeah, you, you are treading on very dangerous territory there, okay? You know, and we can understand their, you know, if it was sincere, we could understand, yeah, well, when you have an emergency situation, then you're going to have to have some emergency laws made to take care of that emergency, okay? I think, you know, most reasonable conservatives would agree to that. But then again, they know the motivations of the liberals who use this immigration issue and having mercy on immigrants as a political issue. Now, here's one ramification of that political issue. Uh, the more immigrants you allow in, okay, and then there's about 30 million immigrants in the United States. You know, they use this figure about 10 million, but it's really a lot more. Um, and I have my sources for that. It's about 30 million. And when it comes time for an election, 30 million votes, especially when they're strategically placed, can have an effect on an election. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that the Democrats are accusing the Republicans of, of um, you know, consorting with the Russians to try to swing the election to the Republicans. But the Democrats are basically want to break the laws of our immigration system so that they can have all these immigrants come to the United States and vote for liberals. Okay, that's how California gets you know, how many more votes for, for the president that they have? Um, Three million? All right, well, if there's 30 million immigrants in the United States, I'm, I'm sure a large portion of those are in California. And, uh, you know, when, when the immigrant comes in, they will thank the Democratic Party for allowing them in, so to speak. And, uh, and they, the Democratic Party says, now you have to vote for us. Okay, this goes on. This is the truth. I'm not making this up. Okay, so the political um, motivations behind immigration, you know, make the hackles of the conservative rise up quite rapidly, and they see what's happening. Okay, so um, you see the difficulty between you know having mercy and justice now. Suzanne, you may not have wanted to go here in your question about the immigrant statue, but I think that immigrant statue is symbolic of this whole problem. Now, we know that Pope uh, Francis is, you know, he, he definitely has liberal leanings. I, I think he's made that quite clear, uh, and most Jesuits are today. Uh, they have a long history. When they first started, they were quite conservative under St. Ignatius of Loyola. But as, you know, the 19th, 20th century came along, they became quite liberal, and they are today. And um, uh, that uh, is the mentality of Pope Francis. And, and so he has a lot of, you know, leanings toward being merciful to immigrants. Okay. Now, he hasn't talked too much about the other side of the story, however, you know the justice that's needed as well as the mercy. And uh, when you find a liberal that does talk about the justice side as much as he talks about the mercy side, then you know you have someone who's rational and ready to talk business and can maybe reach a, a reasonable solution to, the, to this whole problem, okay? And, uh, you know, then you, another political issue, you got guys like George Soros, who's got billions of dollars, and this man is, you know, quite notorious for using his money to basically upset the United States uh, in any way that he can. And he's a liberal, and he wants to get his liberals in, in politics. And, uh, you know, there's talk about Soros funding the people coming from from Central America, you know, I mean, it does take money to move that many people, 
You know, you have to have transportation, you have to feed them, you have to motivate them, you have to have leaders for them. This stuff just doesn't happen in a vacuum. Somebody's behind it, okay? And he's been known to do this. So you have that political motivation uh, behind the whole thing. So that, again, gets the conservatives uh, worrying and gets their hackles up. And, uh, you know, and then the other ploy would be, of course, that if the conservatives don't let them in, then uh, they'll be called names like racist, you know, or, you know, unmerciful. You know, how could you stoop to do this kind of thing? You know, so they get it from all sides. Okay. And that's just the nature of the beast. And uh, the beast is, you know, when do you have mercy? When do you show, show justice? Okay. Theologically, you know, that answer is pretty simple. You know, you show mercy when the person uh, says, I'm sorry, and admits that they've done something against the law uh, that they haven't conserved. Basically, they broke the law. They haven't conserved it. Okay. And... And then if they cry for mercy, well, in order to get that mercy, if you've broken the law, then you're going to have to have a change of attitude because we're not quite sure whether you're going to commit the same sin again, you see. Uh, or maybe you're just fiending uh, 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 sorrow and you just want to get mercy so that you get off the hook, but you haven't changed a bit in your heart, okay? These are all the ramifications that come into deciding, you know, when are we supposed to be merciful? When are we supposed to be um, give a, a, our, our justice to the person? Okay. So, uh, you know, the immigration issue will last a long time, I think, as, as, especially if it affects U.S. elections. And, um, you know, and the other problem, of course, is in the United States, since we're practicing birth control and abortion, and we've killed 50 million since 1973. Okay, so that means we would we would have had 50 million more people in the United States today than we do today. I mean, today than we would otherwise. Okay, and then you think of all the birth control that's going on, and out of those, um, they don't consider them abortions, but when the egg unites with the sperm and creates, you know, the ovum, and that ovum is destroyed by a birth control device, you know, RU486 or whatever it is. They have some new stuff out now. Uh, you know, that's another part of the population that's missing because of our insatiable desire to have our sexual desires without the responsibility of it. Okay. So, um, now, if now that's taking its toll after 50 years of doing these two things, birth control and abortion, uh, it's taking its toll because we can't replace our population. OK, uh, neither can Russia or France or Germany. A lot of these other countries, OK, the Democrat, then as a matter of fact, the demographics show that by 2050, the Muslims will overrun Europe. And the Muslims don't practice birth control or abortion. Okay? Isn't that something? So, uh, you know, it, it creates problems. But so how do you, how do you um, compensate for that if you want votes for your candidate and you don't have enough people to vote for them? How do you compensate for that? You let the immigrants in. They'll vote for you, especially if you give them everything they want. Give them free this, free that. You know, they're talking about giving free health care to, to, to an immigrant who's not a citizen of the United States. While there's U.S. citizens who don't have health care, <laughs> they will give away the store, or at least say they will, for their votes. And once they're in power, who knows what they'll do. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is complicated as you can see and so you know this is why I say that this immigrant this statue in the Vatican is symbolic sy symbolic of a war that's going on 
between liberals and conservatives all over the world. And it's not just about immigrants. It's about a lot of things. Okay. It's about, you know, um, a lot has to do with our sexual attitudes. You know, homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism, you know, all the isms that have to do with sex and birth control and abortion and all this. Okay. Uh, family unit. You know, how do you define the family unit? Who's in control in the family? Uh, you know, uh, women in government and, um, you know, things have changed drastically and liberals are behind most of this because why? They want to change things. They think the old ways may, may have been good for the time that they were invented, but now we are we have come of age, so to speak. We are the moderns. We have become different than people in the you know, 11th century. And therefore, uh, we should look at life differently and you know, blah, blah, blah. And then again, I said, you know, some of that might be good because not everything in the past was great. And, and those things that were bad, we need to change. Okay? But, but we can't go to the exaggerated change that the liberals want and sometimes they think they throw a lot of spaghetti against the wall, see what will stick. It's basically how they operate. And uh, anyway, that's politics. All right. So let me see what else we've got today. Okay. Hiroshi says, um, Ehrman, the agnostic historicist, Carrier, the atheist mythicist, I think both are members of the Jesus Seminar, but certainly they are like uneasy bedfellows. Okay, Hiroshi, that gives me a little bit more information. Um, I'd probably have to go study um, their views to be able to comment intelligently on this, but the Jesus Seminar, you know, that's bad news. Uh, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole if I were you. These are all liberals. And here we go again, you see. And you know, liberals, conservatives, these are, these are the two major branches of human society, liberals and conservatives. You'll find liberals and conservatives in religion. You'll find them in uh, politics. You will find them in science. You, you will find them every, in culture everywhere, okay? These are the two major dividing lines and how humans think about being human and living in this world. Um, but the Jesus Seminar, these, these are liberal theologians who have basically sided with the historical critics and who say that the old doctrines of, you know, that the Bible's inspired is passe, the Bible was written by men, you know, who may have been inspired in the sense of, you know, they had good thoughts, but not by the Holy Spirit of God dictating to them, as our council say, the words that the Holy Spirit wants to put in the Bible. Okay? They don't believe in that anymore. Okay? Uh, they don't believe that Jesus is coming back the second time. They believe the apostles just made that up. All right. Um, what else? Uh, they don't believe in the resurrection. All right. They believe that the idea of a resurrection is uh, something the apostles thought up as they, uh, it was a mental thing. Okay. Uh, the fact that they could invigorate their members to accept Christianity and then go out and preach to everyone else to accept Christianity. This to them, to, to the liberals and the people of the Jesus Seminar, is how they rise from the dead, so to speak. You know, their leader died, and how are we going to raise it? How are we going to raise his program, his, his whole dream for the world? Well, we'll go out there and tell people and bring them in. This is what the Jesus Seminar believes, okay? 
So, uh, and you know, you ask, ask, you have to ask the question: Why do these guys do this? I mean, one guy is an agnostic, Ehrman. The other guy is an atheist. Okay, why do they? Why do they have to go and study Jesus? And you know, and then make their recommendations about what to do with Jesus. Okay. Um, you know, the reason why is because Jesus is he's like glue, man. He just never goes away. You know, once you touch it, it sticks on you. And you can't get rid of it. And it's it bothers you. Who was this man? How does he fit in the whole scheme of things? Why does he have so many followers? What is it? And so what they try to do, and they don't like it. Why? Well, like Jesus said in John 3, men don't come to him because if they do, they know that the light of Jesus will expose the darkness in their souls. That's why they don't come. Because nobody likes their sins exposed. We all keep that pretty private, don't we? Except, you know, for Catholics, we go to the confessional. But we keep that pretty private. Even husbands and wives keep their sins private, at least the best they can. Okay? So it's not something, you know, it's open conversation, you know, free for all. All right? So... We're always trying to hide our sins, and one way to hide your sins is, of course, don't come to Jesus the way he wanted you to come. And But if you do that, as a rational thinking man, you have to have some way of rationalizing why you're not going to accept his message. And so you make up these things about Jesus that uh, say, well, you know, he, he really didn't believe in a resurrection. He was just using that word. And here's what it really means, okay? It doesn't mean you're going to rise from the dead bodily, okay? These are the same guys that say when Jesus was feeding the 5,000 that, you know, it, there was no miracle that occurred there. Really what it was is, you know, uh, some little boy had uh, uh, a, a couple of fish and some bread, but everybody brought their lunch, not just the little boy. Okay, and the apostles, in order to enhance Jesus and make him a figure bigger than life, so to speak, uh, they made up the story that he fed 5,000 people miraculously. That, you know, it took the, the boy's bread and broke it, and the and whole bread was there and broke it, and the whole bread was there and broke it. You know, they made all that up so that they could enhance the, the image of Jesus. To gain more followers. In other words, what they're telling us is that the apostles were just downright dastardly liars. Okay? That's what it boils down to. All right? So the, the issue here is who's the liar? The apostles? Or is it uh, Mr. Ehrman and Mr. Carrier? Okay? Yeah, they're the liars because they're the ones making up stories. Okay? And so, yeah, who cares whether Mr. Ehrman and Mr. Carrier get along? The whole Jesus seminar is, is a big lie, okay? So stay away from it. Um, Charlie says, I believe he will be canonized one day. Maybe not in our lifetime, but in time. And I wonder who he's talking about there. Lawrence says, Jerry would like to debate. What? Study vacantism? He already knows my answer. I've told him a dozen times. And he can't get past that. So I don't think it's going to be a fruitful debate. Um, what's my answer? I'll, I think I've said it before on this program. I'll say it again. You know, it's um, basically it boils down to who has the authority, okay? Do we have the authority to depose a pope? The answer is no. 
okay? There is no authority above the Pope. All right, so um, if someone disagrees with that, then tell me who's going to be the authority, who's going to be the judge? You know, cardinals? And by what canon law? By what Pope? Are they going on this? You can't go by opinion. We know there were, you know, several opinions back in the late Middle Ages. You know, uh, Bellarmine had one, and uh, a few other theologians had some opinions, but they were all different. So that just tells you nobody knows. Okay. If nobody knows, who are you going to go to? Who's going to who's going to adjudicate? which of those five opinions from those five theologians about deposing a pope is correct. There's been no pope or council in all our 2,000-year history that has even addressed the issue. Okay? So, uh, you know, go back to Israel. When they had bad kings, did they ever depose any one of those kings? Not a one. Not a one. You know, let's take a guy like Manasseh ruled 55 years in Israel. And he did things that were horrendous, horrendously sinful. Could they get rid of him legally? No, because there was no one higher than the king. The only one that could do that is God. All right? And, you know, I'd hate to live in Israel at that time because they had 20 kings, and all 20 had negative epitaphs. You know, so-and-so did evil in the sight of the Lord. He's buried with his fathers, blah, blah, blah. All right? This is what happened, and they had the people were stuck with it. And that's the unfortunate thing about having leaders is when the leaders go corrupt, there's not much you can do and, and just wait till they die and hope that you're going to get someone good. All right? Uh, in Judah, they had 20 kings also. Ten of them had a good epitaph. Ten didn't, of course. All right, so that's 50%. Um, and then there were about three who were exceptional, like Josiah, for example. Okay, But the point here is that they had no way to get rid of them. They had to wait. All right, and so the same thing here. Uh, you know, it's, it's no different in, in our era. Uh, so that's my answer. Jerry's never really given me a, a, a counter to that, except some of the things I just suggested. You know, well, there's people that have said we should do this. Yeah, well, how do you know that they're right? Okay, I mean, this is serious business. You're going to depose a pope, you better have 100% accuracy on whether you are right or not, and the procedure you're going to follow, okay? Complaining about a pope is one thing. We all, we all can do that, and we have the right to do that. So there's flies flying around here. You can't see them on your screen, but um, we have the right to do that according to canon law. Even the 1983 code says in Canon 212 that we have the right to bring our concerns to our shepherds, and, and the pope is a shepherd. We can bring our concerns to him, okay? But that's where it stops. You know, we're just parishioners, okay? Lay people. We have no authority whatsoever. The only authority we have is over our children and our, and our spouse, okay? And that's where it stops. So, you know, and we can have our theories. Like, you know, take the Siri theory, for example. You know, there's a lot of credibility to that theory. You know, they think they've put it to bed. They haven't really. Okay. Uh, it's still alive and well because no one has disproved it. You know, there's a lot of opinions flying out there. But, uh, you know, the facts are the facts. This man appeared to have been elected, you know, not only once in 1958, but also uh, in 1963 and 1978. Okay, uh, he just died, what, 80, 1988, 89, around there. And the theory is that he was replaced 
uh, he won the election and was re uh, basically forced out by uh, uh, Masonic forces who had already infiltrated the Vatican and they put in John, this uh, Ron Colley and he became Pope John XXIII, but he, they said he was an anti-Pope, okay? A lot of possibility there, okay? But that's as far as we can take it, all right? And nothing else we can do, all right? So there you have it. That's my answer. So I've debated myself on that, and uh, we'll have to leave it at there. All right, Mike says, Dr. Janice, excuse my ignorant question, but if our planet is motionless, how do we have day and night in 24 hours? Yeah, that is an ignorant question, Mike. Uh, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, well, the only way it could be, of course, Mike, is if the Earth is motionless, that means the other stuff has to go around it, okay? And so the sun would you know start here at 12 noon and go around and in 24 hours it would go back to the same place okay so there's day night day okay and the stars also because basically the whole universe is going around a motionless earth so the universe is carrying the stars and it's carrying the sun and that's why they can go around a fixed Earth, okay? So the Earth basically would be the center of mass, not necessarily the geometric center, but very close to it. But it would be the center of mass uh, around which the universe goes, carrying the stars and the sun with it. And the only difference between the sun and the stars would be that the sun goes a little slower Per day than the stars do around the earth okay the stars go at a faster clip and it takes them 23 hours 56 minutes and 4.1 seconds to complete their their rotation or their revolution around the earth okay the sun takes about three minutes 54 seconds more which amounts to 24 hours exactly, okay? So it lags behind. Every day the sun lags behind a little bit. And that's why we see the sun go through the 12 constellations of the zodiac, okay? Uh, Leo the lion, blah, blah, blah. All right, all 12 of them, the sun, because it's lagging behind, okay, it's going to go the opposite direction that the stars are going around. The sun's going to go real slow this way, and it takes a year for it to go all the way around. Okay? So that's the difference there. Okay? All right. So, all right. Okay, Hiroshi says, the historical Jesus versus the theological Christ, what's your point of view on this, sir? I think it's been in the center of Judeo-Christian discourse within the, within the academia and even among some Bible scholars and historians since the 1980s. Um, there is no difference, you see. That's the point, Hiroshi. You see, what they've tried to do these historical critics is to separate the historical Jesus from the theological Jesus, and you can't do that. All right. Now I tried this twice, and now the third time is the Jesus seminar. They tried it once in the 1700s. It's called the Quest for the Historical Jesus. Okay, so you had all these, and all of them were Protestant. You know, Paulus. Uh, you know, I could just mention many, many names uh, back in the 1700s. And what they tried to do was, at the th same thing I just explained earlier. The main thing was to take the miraculous out of Jesus' life. And the way you do that is you try to explain the miracles as being just 
plain things that happened that were turned into miracles by the apostles. I mentioned the feeding of the 5,000, okay? So, you know, it would be a miracle if Jesus, you know, took off a piece of bread from the loaf and, you know, the whole loaf appeared again as soon as he took off the first piece, if that's how it happened. I'm just guessing, but something miraculous happened. Okay, that's a miracle. Why is it a miracle? What is a miracle? A miracle is something that defies the laws of nature and doesn't happen every day. Okay, it only happens seldomly, and it's something that does not occur naturally. Okay, uh, so miracles, why are they important then? Because they testify to the divinity of Jesus. Okay, uh, he even told the Pharisees, look, if you don't believe in me, at least believe in the miracles that I'm doing. Okay. That will give you the, the evidence that you need that, look, I'm not an ordinary man, okay? I, I am from God, as I say. And if Jesus hadn't performed any miracles, they might have had a right to deny him because he would be just like everybody else, you see. And it, Jesus did so many miracles, John says he couldn't even record them all in his gospel. He said it would take all the books of the world. So not only was Jesus bending over backwards for these people by showing the miracles, okay, they were so numerous we couldn't keep track of them all. So, yeah, he, he knew he had to prove who he was, and he did. But you know what they did? They doubled down. They doubled down. In other words... Jesus performed a miracle in front of them, and they couldn't deny it because they saw, you know, the man with a withered arm. The arm grew back on him immediately. What are you going to do with that? Okay? Jesus backed you into a corner. You know, and he's not trying to be spiteful. He's just saying, look, I'm the, I'm the son of God. All right? I'm here to save you. And, of course, they doubled down because they didn't want to admit their sins. Remember, that's the key. And they say, well, you do miracles by the power of Beelzebub. Mm. And you know what Jesus said in return? Then you're forever damned. No chance of salvation for you. Goodbye, good night. He's only going to give you so much rope until you hang yourself. Okay, that's what he did. But... This is the importance of miracles, okay? They testify in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul's talking about the apostles, he says, we were given miracles so that they could testify to our authenticity, you see. They raised people from the dead. They healed people. Peter's shadow crossed around against someone, and that person was healed. That's miraculous power. All right, all to testify to the authenticity of the preacher, that his message is authentic, you see. That's what miracles do. But these liberals, okay, from the first quest for the historical Jesus, knew that in order to win this battle that they were in, they set themselves up against God, they had to get rid of these miracles somehow. You know what, and you know what they found? They couldn't do it. They had the smartest scholars working on this for almost a hundred years. And they were writing books. You know how the Germans write books? Their whole life is words. And they were writing books by the truckload. You know, for this guy trying to explain how you get rid of miracles, that guy, blah, blah, blah. And it was an utter failure. Why? Because the miracles are so intertwined with, the, with Jesus that you can't separate the history, the miracle history, from the person of Jesus. They are one unit, okay? And they painfully discovered that. But, you know, after another hundred years went along, they tried it again. The second historical quest for Jesus, okay? 
And then you got more modern names from the liberals, like, you know, Boltman and Harnack and all these guys. And, and they tried it again. And they were, again, unsuccessful. And they admitted it themselves. Okay? And then you got the Jesus Seminar, another try to do the same thing. Okay, you cannot separate the historical Jesus from the theological Jesus. It's impossible. And how, you know, and there's an old saying in America: three strikes and you're out. Okay, they've had their chance; they couldn't do it, and you know we're right back to the same gospel we had before. Okay. All right, um, I got about four minutes left. Let's look at another one. Okay, I have a. I have a discussion with a friend concerning the use of Lucifer in exalt, exaltet in Easter Vigil. He argued that Catholic worship, the Catholics worship Lucifer since this is pro proper name of Satan based on his reading on Isaiah 14:12 KJV King James Version. But I argue that this is just an illusion uh illusion of satan since this verse refers to the king of babylon moreover as catholics we don't have any problem with use of lucifer because christ is the true morning star can you please expound the correct interpretation of isaiah 14 12. yeah uh you are correct vince that um that passage isaiah 14 12 is talking about the king of babylon okay what the bible will sometimes do is um, it will um, mix and match history with prophecy or history with history. And sometimes it will give us two stories in one narrative, okay? And, and it will address the second narrative by making metaphors or figures of speech or things of that sort. Uh, symbolic language sometimes um, that uh, it will use to to bring out the second narrative all and and that means that the first narrative the first what I should say not narrative I should say the meaning of the narrative uh, the first level is historical okay there actually was in other words a king of Babylon you know who went through everything that Isaiah described in Isaiah 14 okay and but the language there is uh, figuratized to such an extent that it's also talking about the fall of the devil okay and his name at that time before he fell historically is attributed as Luc Lucifer okay the proper name, Lucifer, and son of the light, okay? And he fell, all right? And so, you know, we call him the devil and Satan now. We don't call him, you know, I mean, some people might call him Lucifer because that was his old name, okay? And the same thing happened to the king of Babylon. You see, he was um, Nebuchadnezzar, and he was raised up by God to take Babylon, or take um, Benjamin captive, okay, and then when his job was over, you know, God humbled Nebuchadnezzar. We read about that in Daniel chapter 4, and he was made to basically understand that the only reason he was allowed to take Judah into captivity was because God was behind it and was using him to uh, punish the, the the Judah, okay? But he fell from his perch just basically like Lucifer fell from his perch. And that's why the two are intermingled in Isaiah 14, okay? So the Bible does that, you know, not all the time, but, um, you know, it's <laughs> the Bible is really deep in, the, in that sense. Um, Daniel does it, uh, Hosea does it, Jeremiah does it, Isaiah does it. Uh, it's just amazing how they will take an historical situation 
and then put symbolic language in there that leads us to another uh, series of events in the future that are going to happen. Okay, uh, even Matthew does it. Luke does it. Um, Matthew's gospel in um, Matthew 24. You know, you have an historical situation in Jerusalem, uh, but there's enough symbolic language in that chapter that also applies to the end of the world. As a matter of fact, the chapter closes, not the chapter doesn't close, but the, the pericope that Jesus is, is giving us closes with the end of the world, the true end of the world, okay? But we could also say that there was like the end of the world for the Jews in, you know, 70 AD when the Romans came in and conquered them. That was the end of their world, the end of their age, so to speak. And so Matthew is intertwining both of these historical events, you know, one historical 70 AD and one historical uh, future historical, that is the second coming of Christ, into one chapter, okay? Pretty interesting how he does that, all right? So um, you know, I just wanted to give you that uh, to back up the understanding of Isaiah 14. All right, uh, Gage says, what is your favorite Old Testament passage and your favorite New Testament passage to demonstrate one can be saved but then fall away? <laughs> uh, well, let me see, favorite New Testament passage. Um, like Jesus says, you know, those who remain faithful to the end will be saved. I think that's my favorite. I think it says it all, okay? Um, Old Testament passage. Um, you know, I, I really like the one in Ezekiel 33, 11, where God is basically crying to Israel and says, I've given you everything, Israel. Why will you die, O house of Israel? You know, I mean, it's clear there. I also like that one in Zechariah where God says, you come to me, I'll come to you. You know, so, you know, our God is, he's very dynamic. And he's, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm amazed every time I open the Bible and read about him, I'm just absolutely amazed what a dynamic personality he is. Anyway, so I don't like to give favorites, but those are just too off the cuff. Okay, so it uh, looks like we're done here. Uh, Wesley, I'm sorry I didn't get to you. I, I am over time. Um, but let me just read your question, and then we'll get to it. To, um, it'll have to be next week. Robert, why did God command the Jews to commit usury against other nations in Deuteronomy 23 and Deuteronomy 28? Isn't usury condemned outright in the fathers and by the popes of the West? Okay, so I'm not going to tease you with giving you a partial answer. I will answer that. Forthwith, next Tuesday, which is October the 8th, 7 p.m. I don't know when we change our clocks back. We're on Eastern Daylight Time, 7 p.m. until further notice. And I will see you again at that time. May God bless you and keep you safe. Please, please pray for me. And please uh, go to our website, robertsongenis.com and look at the books we have for you for your growth in your faith and your love of god and all those things that you need to be a christian they are there for your pleasure and again we'll see you next week bye-bye